Well, I think it all started with a very excellent journalism professor who used to strike out what she called superfluous words, words carrying bias with her red pen. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Susan Burroughs. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the subscribe links over in the right-hand sidebar. You can subscribe on your Android phone, your iPhone, it's Stitcher Radio, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find author stories. We're also on YouTube. There's a link over in the right-hand sidebar as well. And you can subscribe there and never miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by the AIPP, the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. If you are an indie author and you need to build a support team to help you uh, format your book, edit your book, get a cover designed for your book, the anything that an indie author needs to get their book out there, the AIPP has a member that can help you make your book your product the very best it can be. If you look in the uh, show notes at the bottom of this episode, you'll find a link to the AIPP or go to aippconline.org slash members and browse through the member library and find the professional to fill out your team. Like I said, anything that you need to make your indie publishing journey a success, there's a member there to help. It's a very simple website, very easy to navigate through. Go check out AIPPonline.org slash members today and fill out your indie author team. At the end of the show, be sure to stick around for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my new friend, Susan Burroughs, on the show with me today. Uh, Susan has a fantastic new book. It's called Off the Rails, One Family's Journey Through Teen Addiction. And this is such a powerful book, uh, guys. Uh, I, I definitely want you to check it out and, uh, and pick up a copy from Susan. Uh, Susan, welcome to the show today. Well, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. I know we have a lot of great stuff to talk about, uh, but before we can do that, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, I've always written, and I was very excited in high school, especially to have a poem of mine included in um, in an anthology of uh, high school poetry, and It excited me to no end. I was sure that I was going to be uh, a great writer. And uh, then I went to college and at Kent State University and took up journalism. And uh, somehow my boat just got off course and uh, went into uh, advertising instead after learning about some of the um, less savory practices in, in journalism at the time. So I spent years and years in advertising and wrote copy uh, during that time. So uh, I have come a complete circle uh, back to the type of writing that I love and happy to be here. Well, you know, uh, advertising is its own brand of storytelling. It is. (laughs) Very, very short stories. (laughs) Right, right. But, you know, you're you're still trying to connect with someone on an emotional level. You you want them to to feel an attachment to whatever it is that you're selling. And, you know, while uh, it's a commercial endeavor, endeavor, obviously, uh, but, you know, so is. So is most writing. Um, it, I, I think a, a lot of people overlook it as 
uh, as uh, sometimes good training ground for writing fiction? Um, it, it can be. What I find, though, is that in order to make an emotional connection to your audience, you really have to be emotionally connected yourself mm. to your story and bring that authenticity to your writing. And I think that that completes the connection. Yeah, yeah, I could see that for sure. Um, when when you were a youngster, you said that you were you were always a writer. You were always writing. Um, I, I find that to be the case with the the vast majority of folks that I've got to meet on the show. Uh, the I, I really do believe that that some people are just born storytellers. Uh, were you a big reader uh, when you were a kid? Constantly, yeah. uh, constantly reading, constantly writing. Constantly having my diary stolen by <laughs> my brother and passed around school. Um, constantly being chased out of the house by my poor mother who thought I needed some fresh air. Put that book down and go and play. <laughs> so, so yes, in, in short, I, I always love reading. I still love reading. Uh, and, uh, my, uh, my philosophy is that writers should be readers. Uh, and share in the community uh, that way. Yeah, ab absolutely. You you know, there's uh, the two great rules to, to be a writer. You need to read a lot and you need to write a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I like to add a third. And that third is you need to uh, to be around people and understand mm -hmm. uh, how to report on the human condition. Yes, I, I would agree that uh, that's ideal. Yes. I think it's harder for some writers to do that, though, because writers by nature, uh, many of us tend to be introverts. So I think that third part that you throw in there is probably the most challenging for myself and for a lot of other writers as well. Oh, I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> by any <laughs> means, by any means. Uh, but, you know, we we all have... Uh, you know, got to that place where we've spent just way too much time alone and, and it, it starts to kind of seep out in your, in your writing. And sometimes you, you need to, you know, make the, the uncomfortable decision to, uh, to, to look at someone else's face every now and then. And, and that, that is the biggest challenge, uh, for a lot of us writers and me included. Mm -hmm. um, what was that initial desire, uh, for you to, uh, to want to be a journalist. What, what was that? Uh, what was the initial draw there for you? Well, I don't want to date myself, but it was probably Watergate. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea that the fourth estate could move the country uh, to make decisions and to change history. And I was struck by the fact that uh, writing could be so powerful, so big. And uh, that did uh, really impress me. And and for those of you that didn't live through Watergate, go uh, get a copy of All the President's Men, and, and you can see the power of the press uh, mm -hmm. in, in that situation. Yes. Um. So, how did how did you pursue that? Uh, you you went to did you go to college to study journalism? I did. I became a journalism major at Kent State University, which uh, it, it sounds as though you are a history buff. Uh, and you may know that Kent State was the epicenter for uh, a protest movement, at least in the eastern part of the country. Yep. And so it was a very politically active campus. And uh, there was a great deal of um, a great deal of food for political writing there. So. It, it was it was a great experience to be a part of a student body that was uh, that that was so active in politics. As with uh, a lot of uh, historical events, and, and then that did kind of become uh, what's a what's a good word? Uh, kind of become institutionalized. Uh, we. We have the tendency to romanticize uh, things that happened, and then uh, things tend to get weird uh, after that sometimes. And it sounds uh, to me like you had a bit of an eye-opening experience with, with what you thought journalism was, and then to maybe some unsavory things that were going on uh, in journalism. What was that experience that, that drove you away from it? 
Well, I think it all started with a very excellent journalism professor who used to strike out what she called superfluous words, words carrying bias with her red pen. And I would get my papers back, pieces that I thought were incredibly objective and reporterish. And I would get them back and they, it would just be a sea of red. And I started noticing uh, in my reading of newspapers, the bias in the headlines, the bias in the writing, all of those red line words as I came to call them. And uh, it really struck me at how we build in attitudes and uh, um, viewpoints into our writing, even when we don't mean to do that. It's just a, that part of you and your opinions must appear in the writing just by the nature of what writing is. And then I started noticing, especially in local media, that um, ads would appear on the same day as very as articles that were very flattering towards the ad, um, the object of the ad. So if there was an ad for... <laughs> is say, you know, tanning beds, then maybe the, um, the article would talk about uh, the, the advent of tanning beds in uh, the state and how vitamin D is so important. I, I, I don't know. So I, just off the cuff, that's probably not the best example. But um, it was if, if an ad if ad dollars flow into a newspaper, it can potentially affect the way that a newspaper treats an article or a subject. So I thought to myself, well, well, Susan, if you're going to be a hypocrite, you might as well be upfront about it. And I switched over into advertising and uh, I had a number of good years in advertising. I was in advertising for about 15 years before moving on to teaching, and um, I had fun. It was uh, it was all up front. We knew what we were doing. We were trying to find uh, the best parts. It was business to business advertising, so we were trying to find the best parts of our business to put forth. And it was interesting work and, and very rewarding. Yeah. Um, what did you teach? I taught communication studies. I went back to school uh, after my time in advertising. And um, actually, in during my years in advertising, I became part of the National Training Task Force for my agency and realized that I really loved uh, this idea of training and continuing education for people and uh, went back to school to get a master's in organizational communication which then led me into a number of years uh, in the classroom teaching at two different universities and uh, enjoying uh, that environment and loving the students and then organically shifting into uh, training in organizations, uh, being asked to do work in presentation skills training and conflict management and leadership training, uh, those sorts of corporate offerings. Uh, after our experience with my daughter, um, I pulled back from my training and really from being in public at all and ultimately looked for a more collegiate environment and ended up um, back uh, at the university where I now work at a third university in the admissions department. And my role is uh, a, a admissions representative, I specialize in visits. And so I work with uh, many, many student guides and uh, many uh, underserved uh, populations who come to visit the university. So it's a great, great work. Well, it sounds like it. It, yeah. it really does. Um, you you mentioned uh, what you went through with your daughter. Uh, so let, let's touch uh, on uh, the new book, Off the Rails, One Family's Journey Through Teen Addiction. Um, uh, you mentioned what you did, uh, what you went through with your daughter. What, what did you go through with her? What, what was the, the story there? 
Well, my story is probably the same as a lot of stories, a, a lot of people's stories who may be listening right now. Um, and that is just suddenly watching a teen spiral out of control. And um, it happened so fast. It was unexpected. Uh, in fact, my children used to, to tease us that we wanted to be a 1950s TV family. <laughs> and uh, so, so That's when, us. yeah, right. Yeah. And I mean, this is what we all want when we have this vision, when we have children that we're going to be this household and all their friends are going to be over and we're going to make cookies and et cetera. But uh, that was not to be for us. And uh, when she was uh, 15, uh, she just uh, started changing and she changed in a lot of different ways. She stepped away from her um, existing friends. She became a very moody to the point of being malicious. Uh, she started skipping school. She started uh, sneaking out at night. Uh, and then uh, there came the, the high risk behaviors. Uh, at the end of that spiral, we saw her um, using a, a variety of drugs and um, cutting and uh, being absent uh, from the house for uh, days at a time. So, again, that, that just happened. It, it was a blink. She went from what we considered a relatively normal uh, teenager to this uh, young woman in distress. And it was horrible to watch and to experience and to be a part of uh, that. And I know that... Um, that a lot of people out there have felt that that confusion and, and that desperation. Um, Susan, a lot of uh, a, a lot of parents go through things with with teenagers when, especially around that age that you were talking about, around 15, uh, 15, 16, especially uh, where kids want to um, kind of make their own mark, uh, find out who they are. Uh, and sometimes that means, uh, doing things differently from their parents and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, challenging norms and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and, you know, I, I think most, most parents are kind of in, in tune with that. And, you know, you, you kind of come to expect some of that and, and, and then you, you try to be there to mitigate those things and, you know, have conversations with your kids and, you know, all the things that, that we do to, to try to help them through this transition period of life. Hmm. Uh, how do you, uh, because you, you're obviously an, an in tune mother and, and, and paying attention and, uh, you know, plugged in with your family. Uh, how do you start, realizing that this is something more than just typical teenage behavior? Well, I think that's one of the hardest things that a parent has to face is trying to find, to figure out when your teen crosses that line from normal oppositional teen behaviors to something else, something darker. Right. And one of the things that my daughter has shared with me in uh, the time after going through these programs that we put her into was that she believes that there were a lot of uh, young people in those programs that didn't necessarily belong there. So I think that um, one of the reasons that we wanted to put this information out into the world was this is what it looks like or something like this or something at this level before you should start thinking about taking extreme measures to help your child. When you say, um, uh, when she says there were, there were kids there that didn't belong there in, in what sense, uh, that this was not appropriate treatment for, for them. Did they have a, uh, was she saying that some people have a, a different condition? What did she mean by that? Um, well, she meant, uh, that there were, um, there were young women there who were there because they had been raped as an example uh, gotcha. and their families didn't know how to deal with it. Sure. 
or who had broken curfew or who, 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 or who were smoking weed or who were um, doing other um, what we would call normal teen infractions. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, and the parents would have this knee jerk reaction and uh, send them directly into programs. And most frequently that would be the wilderness programs uh, that right. they would send them into. Uh, we tried, uh, we first tried outpatient therapy. Um, we had a misdiagnosis. We had an overdose. We had near death before we stepped into wilderness and then a therapeutic treatment center, uh, which was locked down and then finally a group home. So we went through um, three extreme programs in two years, but um, we felt driven to that. And part of this writing is a cautionary tale to those people who perhaps shouldn't be sending their kids there uh, because there are, there are after effects, there is scarring. Uh, it is not an easy program, and you have to weigh the the benefits or against the risks. You put it that way. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that there was a misdiagnosis uh, early on. Uh, what happened there? Well, there is uh, what those those of us parents who have been through this call it the uh, diagnosis du jour, <laughs> and uh, it tends to trend. And during the time that my daughter was uh, falling uh, uh, off the rails, if you will, uh, she was uh, in a group that of it, it was popular to um, diagnose as bipolar. And it was also the years where uh, teen use of ecstasy soared. So we know that there were a lot of misdiagnoses because uh, teens were using drugs that were making them appear to be bipolar and then simply lying to their uh, therapists because they could. And no teen wants to admit, yes, you know, I'm using ecstasy and then uh, I'm using, uh, you know, downers to, to steady myself afterwards. And that looks just like bipolar disorder. So um, even though I respect that bipolar disorder is very real and that there are many, um, many kids who are experiencing it and who do uh, very uh, well on a variety of medications, in our case, it was a misdiagnosis. It was treated by a psychotropic drug called lithium, which has a very narrow tolerance so my daughter was taking that drug needlessly, and then she was also taking recreational drugs. And um, it's no surprise that she ended up, uh, uh, the doctor said, one or two pills away from a coma or death. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So, and, and, and even that, Hank, that wasn't enough to get us to, to uh, send her away. It was after that when she started... Uh, uh, her high risk behaviors again when we finally said no we we can 't help her here, and we may be hurting her, and we may be putting her in danger by keeping her home so that's that 's the story of how we made that decision well susan in in the book you um, you tell the story in a in a very vivid and, and a raw um, uh, kind of narrative and and it really does read like uh, uh less like a, a memoir I, I guess that's kind of what you would what you would categorize this uh less like that and more like uh uh more like a novel it's it's very engaging your storytelling style and i use storytelling uh not in the fiction sense but in the the way that you communicate the story to us um and i i'm beginning to understand now the probably some of the desire to tell the story. Um, when, when you're describing the situation to me that you just did, uh, and you have a, a child with, uh, with a substance abuse, um, issue 
And now you have uh, not only that issue that you're dealing with, you also have the medical community who is uh, kind of exacerbating that by adding these other things that are not wrong, uh, but possibly, you know, uh, opening new doors and setting off new triggers. And, and, and then you have to deal with that stuff. Um, as the parent who is dealing with this in, in the moment when this is going on, how do you start trying to separate uh, good advice from bad advice and and trying to, to actually get down to the truth of what's going on with your child when when no one seems to be helping? Honestly, Hank, I don't think we were sure ever. And if if I may say I felt self-doubt the entire time that my child was away. And um, I just, I really, I started speaking to parents uh, while my child was away. And they also experienced the same doubt. Uh, so what I'm trying to do here is just to say, I can't, relieve your doubt. I can't relieve my own guilt and my doubts or, you know, the steps that we took. All I can do is try to give you a value free look into what the programs are like so that you are, are ready to make the decision knowing full well what you are choosing. Um, I did it in two voices so that, um, particularly parents, could hear the perspective, uh, hear some of the thoughts, and uh, share some of the writing of my daughter when she was in the program so that they got a sense for how this will affect uh, their their children. I think it's a big decision, uh, and I, I just wanted to make sure that um, with in, in a world where we know that 75% of students um, self-report using addictive substances. 75%, three out of every four students are trying addictive substances that we need to know that there is a, that, that there is a pyramid, if you will, of treatments and that we should never st start at the top of the pyramid. We should always start with the the lesser interventions and work our way forward. That's the only thing. That's the only advice that I could probably give someone. That is such a scary statistic. It is. It really is. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned earlier and in, in you talk about it in the book, these, uh, these serious interventions, uh, that, that you guys, um, uh, wound up, uh, doing with your daughter. Uh, tell us about these. Uh, you, you mentioned the wilderness uh, and, and some other treatment programs. Uh, what is, I, I don't know that I've, that I've heard of some of these, but uh, what, what brought you to that point and, and what are these programs? Well, we uh, ultimately worked with an educational consultant uh, to figure out how to first keep our child at home. Uh, helped us put together a, a, a behavioral contract. We tried to, you know, we tried all kinds of incentives and bribes to try to change her behavior and keep her home. Uh, ultimately, though, we had to go back to that consultant and say, we're tapped out. We've tried everything. Uh, can you help us? And educational consultants visit dozens of programs every year and make recommendations based on your case. And uh, the educational that we, uh, the educational consultant that we use, which was Bowdoin, is um, took the time and trouble to actually go uh, to the behavioral hospital where my daughter was detoxing and interview her. And uh, it wasn't until then that we really knew that we were likely to, to have to send her away and came back to us with three recommendations, and uh, we went uh, and visited uh, the schools that they recommended. So it, it was it was a process, uh, Hank. I, I mean, I don't mean to go on about it, but it, it took months. It was a process, and uh, but we did we did look for professional help in trying to to find the programs. 
So what what was the the nature of uh, of this really intense program? <laughs> well, um the first program was wilderness and uh wilderness was all about stripping the teens of uh everything from that they hold on to in their life, their friends, their um their drug use, their electronics. So um, it was, she actually laughs now uh, about the story when she first arrived. Uh, she had uh, to strip down. She had a strip search to make sure that there were no drugs on her person. And they had her take her large gauges out of her ears and then told her, uh, you better tuck those up under your hat because they're going to freeze off <laughs> if you let your earlobes hang out of your hat. And oh, she my didn't goodness. Leave them. But uh, she did go and live uh, on the high desert in the snow. Uh, the kids there are set up in groups of six, and they're nomads, especially, uh, essentially. They, they walk from camp to camp. Uh, they make their own fires if they can. They, if they can't, they live without a fire. Um, they dig their own latrines. They uh, make camp every night. They sleep in a sleeping bag in a liner in the snow. No ground cover, no tents. It is the harshest of conditions. Um, they cook their own food. If they have fire, they, they cook in an old coffee can on a fire. Uh, if they don't have fire, they eat cold bagged food that's delivered once a week. It is a very, very harsh situation. And during that time, they have um, community meetings every day with the other uh, girls on the staff. And they have a weekly visit from a uh, a therapist who comes out and they actually have group therapy. Uh, and it, it's an amazing sight, Hank. Uh, we did go out to visit her while she was there and uh, we had ventured up to the plateau where they were camping. And there is a therapist sitting there with his, with his group around him in the middle of a pile of snow uh, and just going through um what you would expect regular group therapy to do. So it's amazing. See, I, I thought I had heard of intense recovery programs, but that's, that's got to be the most hardcore intense uh, one I've ever heard of. Well, they went from, she went from there to one that is maybe even more intense that even though it was physically less intense, it was emotionally more intense because they, insist on absolute uh, bare honesty from the teens. So she moved from this initial uh, period. I, she was uh, in wilderness about three months. And then uh, she moved over to this lockdown uh, therapeutic uh, the residential uh, school. And she went to school seven days a week. She had group uh, and therapy twice a day. Uh, and they were very, very rule driven, uh, points driven. Uh, it was probably not a model that you'll find much anymore because gratefully they've moved away from much of the confrontation in their therapy. But we also attended therapy there and it was, was very, uh, it was very aggressive. My daughter to this day calls it attack therapy. Wow. Yes. When you um, when you talk to people that have been through uh, twelve step programs, uh, and, and I don't know if if any of these were or not, but one one thing that you uh, hear them talk about is having to admit uh, that you're no longer in control and that you can't uh, fix the problems and that that you you're going to need help. I, I think that's probably the, the cornerstone of, uh, of of getting better is admitting that that you need help. Um, that also applies, uh, especially in this situation where, where you're a parent, uh, especially to a minor child. And, and, and I think you probably feel this way long after your child is not a minor anymore, but you know, you're still a parent, um, that 
you have to come to a point where you have to admit that, that you and your family need help. Um, mm -hmm. what is that process like when, when you realize this thing is just way bigger than I can tackle and we're going to have to, uh, go to some serious intervention that maybe I've never even contemplated or, or knew existed? We took therapy in so many different flavors. Uh, going through this time with um, with our daughter. And one of the things that I'm hoping that the book uh, conveys is how important it is for families to come together and to support each other uh, through these uh, terrible times. Uh, we went through uh, couples therapy, my husband and I. My other daughter, my younger daughter, went to therapy. We went to therapy together, and we also went to therapy weekly uh, first on a satellite phone when uh, my daughter was in wilderness and then uh, on a conference call as she moved into a therapeutic setting. So we were a part of the therapy for the duration of the time that she was away. And um, we also... Um, supported her by doing everything that she was doing. So everything that she was reading, every assignment that she was given, uh, my husband and I also read everything, wrote everything, talked about everything, went through therapy on the same issues that she was going through so that it could foster a better conversation between us and our daughter who's working so hard uh, to crawl out of uh, the place that she'd gotten herself. And I, I just also want to say, Hank, here that that a lot of the kids who who come into this kind of situation are um, dual diagnosis. So even though it may not have been bipolar disorder, uh, there is a good chance that my daughter was dealing uh, with some of her own mental issues by um, – self-medicating and that many of our children who are turning into addicts start by self-medicating for anxiety or um, social social discomfort uh, things like that um, Susan I don't want to completely give the book away we, we want people to uh, <laughs> to go out and, and pick up their copy uh, of off the rails but um, being on the other side of the story, uh, at what point did you realize that this was a story that needed to be written and told? Well, it was it was during the time that um, that she first went away, and I agreed to speak to uh, other people uh, who were considering the program. I also had many people in my own community who would call me and say, "I have a friend," or "I have a friend of a friend." Can I give them your number? They're going through much of the same thing. I spoke to so many people and all of our stories were so similar that I thought that there was a place for a book like this, uh, especially a book. I don't want to, um, uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to paint the book as being so grim. It, it has a lot of grim topics in it, but I want to make sure people know that this is a story of love. Uh, and it's a story of hope, and it's a story about families working together, and that uh, those are all of the themes that came up in all of those calls uh, and all of that mentorship, uh, those mentorship moments uh, through the time that my daughter was away. And what happened to me was I just sat down and thought that I would write it first for myself, and I wrote a draft in almost, it took just under a year to just write an expository draft from beginning to end. And uh, being very <laughs> inexperienced as a, as a writer, I thought that I had written a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and found out otherwise as soon as I found a talented editor who agreed to read the book. And 
I will never forget that meeting with that editor when uh, she showed up to our our uh, uh, coffee that we had set up and she put my manuscript down on the table and it was mostly post-it notes by that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she said, so you want to make this into a book, do you? <laughs> Yeah, I, I love when you have that conversation and she's yeah. like, honey, honey, this is not a book, but there is a book in there. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Uh, so that's that's how it happened. Um, but I was always happy to have had those conversations, uh, to have all of the letters and journals uh, from my daughter and myself during that time and to have in, injected those into a manuscript because – Later, as I tried to add craft and I tried to make the book, write the book in a way that would be engaging and palatable, um, I was able to find those kernels of emotion, those snippets of dialogue uh, that I had written down verbatim. So I, I think that it brought a lot to the ultimate uh, writing of the book. Uh, Susan, what a powerful story this is. Uh, I, I can't recommend it enough to everyone. Uh, whether you're a parent or not, uh, this is a story that, uh, that, that crosses many, many boundaries and, uh, I, I think is a, uh, is, is a crucial story. Um, when, uh, if, if people are just finding out about you and the work that you're doing, uh, where can they find you online? Well, my website is uh, susanburrows.com, and I'm also on Facebook, as you might expect, Susan Burrows uh, Author. And um, although I avoid Twitter just a bit, sorry, Twitter, uh, but I just I just started uh, Instagram at the urging of my friends, so I'm a newbie on Instagram as well, uh, and that would be Burrows into Books. Um, Great. We'll put links to it uh, to all of your places in the show notes. Uh, Susan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. The new book is called Off the Rails, One Family's Journey Through Teen Addiction. Uh, I, I, I love the work that you're doing, Susan, and uh, thank you so much for coming on the show with me today. Thank you for having me, Hank. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. On the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Joey locked the doors of the Washington Irving Chapel and checked the windows from the outside, making sure that the cemetery offices were dark. Satisfied, he donned a knit cap and trudged uphill to the employee parking lot. He'd forgotten how desolate the grounds became at night. A fog had gathered, blurring the moon and stars. His rusty Volkswagen Beetle, christened Ladybug by Jason, sat in shadow alongside his dad's white van, which bore an image of the horseman and the cemetery's web address. Joey swept a palmful of condensation from Ladybug's windshield and fumbled for his keys. He heard a laugh, high and young. He froze. Hello? He shook off goose flesh and found his key. He started the engine and backed out, headlights off, praying not to knock over a headstone again. A child stood on the hillside amongst the graves. You okay, kid? Cemetery's closed. He turned on his headlights. The child vanished. Joey idled in the drive, frowning. What had just happened? He turned off the headlights and waited for his eyes to adjust. The silhouette reappeared. The child stood in the road now, blocking his way. He and the ghost stared at each other. He bit his tongue and squinted over the steering wheel. He couldn't resolve the ghost's features, only a tiny body in... Ruffles? Yes, a dress. A little girl with shoulder-length hair. The figure crouched, threw its arms over its head and skipped away. A giggle followed after. The ghost skipped up the hill, turned around, and beckoned through the fog. Please come. Joey shook his head. No way. Ain't gonna happen. 
but he felt compelled to follow. What could a little girl do to him after all? He would keep a safe distance. The gravel sounded like soft rain beneath his tires. It drew him helplessly, past weeping cypresses and mausoleums blue with moonlight. He followed the giggle, the skipping ribbons, the little body made of shadow and quicksilver. The north end of the cemetery grounds rose to a steep wooded slope. The ghost had led him to Section 77, the northernmost boundary of the cemetery, but he'd lost her. He killed the engine, summoned his courage, and climbed out. The night air brought him fully awake. Where are you? he whispered, scanning the graves. A row of diseased hemlock trees stood at the fence line. Joey knew them well. They were dying, infested by some parasite called, he fished for the name, Woolly Adelgig. His crew had cut them back many times, lopping off limbs and heads, trying to save them. The hemlocks had grown back twisted and tormented. They stood as a row of grotesque sentinels guarding the threshold of the forest. The ghost climbed the slope, spun at the fence, and sat hugging her knees. The black mass of the Rockefeller State Park Preserve loomed behind her. What do you want? Joey whispered. Play. He stepped forward, hands shaking. He just wanted to see her face, the face of a real ghost. To see the curve of her cheek, the sparkle that might have been her left eye. Come and play, Joey. He froze. The sound of his name terrified him. She pointed over his shoulder. Play with us. He turned and realized his mistake. He'd driven with his eyes on the girl, trying not to lose her, never looking behind. They had been followed. 